1-855-935-9396. What's stopping you? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? You, you, you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hi there, welcome to a special mailbag edition of Call to Communion here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We're not going to take calls today. We do these uh, mailbag programs from time to time so that we can um, uh, tackle more of these emails that you have been sending us. Our email address is uh, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. If you have a question about the Catholic faith, this, uh, faith, this is the program to... Uh, to let us know what that question might be. Uh, sometimes people walk around with uh, misconceptions of what the Catholic Church really teaches, what it really stands for, what it's really all about. Uh, well, what better way to clear up those misconceptions than to call an expert? Or, in this case, on today's show, send an email to that expert. So the address, again, is ctc at ewtn.com. I'm not going to mention the phone numbers today because we're not on the phone today. Matt Kabinsky gets the day off. Uh, I'm Tom Price, along with uh, our fabulous uh, engineer and producer, Rich Jesse, and Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Couldn't be better. We are uh, recording this in anticipation of it actually airing on Good Friday, or not, not Good Friday, Black Friday. Oh, okay. All so right. this is going to air the day after Thanksgiving here in the United States. This is a big shopping day. Uh, so if you're out and about, we're glad that you chose to uh, carry us along with you. I wondered when we were when we were today. I wasn't sure what we were. Now you for. know. Now I know. Okay. Now you know. So it's uh, it's Black Friday. We're not going to play any Steely Dan music uh, in commemoration of Black Friday, but just know that we would probably like to. <laughs> uh, I want to lead off here with a very interesting email from uh, Tyler in Oregon, Staten, Oregon. Uh, he says, uh, hi, Tom and Dr. Anders. You guys are awesome. Dr. Anders, I was wondering if you could explain the infamous Canon 9 from the Council of Trent. In discussions with my Protestant friends, I have never noticed, I have never noticed the word impious until now, which obviously makes a huge difference. My friends believe repentance is necessary for salvation, so it seems to me one of the biggest differences in the Catholic doctrine versus Luther or Calvin's view of justification becomes a matter of the belief in free will. Could you please tie these things together for me in your usual wonderful way? Thanks for all you do. God bless. That's from Tyler in Oregon. Tyler, thank you so much. Okay, so let me read Canon 9 from Session 6 of the Council of Trent, the yep. Canons Concerning the Doctrine of Justification. Canon 9 reads, If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. All right, now, of course, just to clarify, this an anathema is an ecclesiastical penalty. It doesn't mean that the Council of Trent is condemning all people who hold this doctrine to hell or anything like that. It just means that this is not an allowable doctrine for a Catholic. Catholic cannot believe this Lutheran doctrine. That's what that means. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> question about what's the difference between the Catholic position, the Lutheran position on the nature of justification, the role of the will, and all the rest of it. Let me sum it up this way. The key difference between, one of the key differences between the Catholic and the Protestant understanding of justification is that the, the Protestant believes at the end of the day that a person can be reconciled to God in a saving relationship to God while he remains at enmity with God in his will. Hmm. All right. Now, that, that phraseology doesn't come from any particular Protestant dogmatic statement, but that's a that's a interpretation, that's a summary of the Protestant position, that ultimately it is through faith alone, it's by believing the promises of Christ, that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to the believer and the believer is accounted righteous by God, not because of anything intrinsic to the person, but only because of the act of obedience of Christ. So that a person remains, and this is Luther's language, a person remains simultaneously just and a sinner. That's what Luther said. Simul justus et peccator. All right? Gee. You can be justified by God, reconciled to God, accepted by God, while remaining objectively sinful in your interior life. Simultaneously just and a sinner. Luther's formulation, very important part of his doctrine. The Catholic position, and I maintain the biblical position, is that the reconciliation that we have with God is impossible if we remain at enmity with God in our wills. 
All right. Mm, okay. And so uh, it is true. God forgives us. We become members of the body of Christ through faith, not by works of the law. Mm-hmm. But the the grace of justification infused into us gives us an inherent righteousness that makes us not merely reputed to be righteous, but actually righteous, acceptable to God because of what he has made us to become, not of just how he perceives us. This is the teaching of sacred scripture. If you read the, the, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 3, we read that those of us who walk in the Spirit... For those of us who walk in the Spirit, the demands of the law, the righteous requirements of the law, are fully met. Because what does the law ultimately require? The the, the command to love, that we love God and love neighbor. Uh, This is the sum of the law and the prophets, according to Romans 13.8. And Romans 5.5 tells us that the love of God is, in fact, shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So those who believe on Christ are forgiven their sins, and they're made actually righteous by the work of God in our hearts, and we're not in enmity with God in our wills. Our wills are reconciled to God. All right. So that's the that's the key difference in this, in keeping with the teaching of sacred scripture. If you read chapter 16 of the Council of Trent, you'll read the very same thing taken from the language of St. Paul, that those who have been justified by God, who have been given the gift of the Spirit, whose hearts have been renewed, can be considered to have fully met the demands of the divine law. Mm, fascinating. Uh, pretty heady stuff, though, wouldn't you it's say? It's very heady stuff. Yeah, yeah, but uh, for for those who really understand that, this is this is very important. Well, you know, you c- you can you can talk for for years, literally, about the exegesis of Saint Paul. But what it boils down to is, does the salvation we have in Christ, does it actually change us and make us acceptable to God, or are we made acceptable to God only because of something somebody else did, because of Jesus, and He leaves us? in one manner or another, in the state of actual sin. The Catholic position is that we're forgiven of our past sins and we're made actually righteous. We're actually given the love of God. Praise God for that. We're about nine minutes after the hour. This is a special mailbag edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. If you'd like to shoot us an email for a future program, the address is ctc at EWTN.com, ctc at EWTN.com. When we come back from our quick break, we'll get to one from Anchorage, Alaska. This is a special mailbag edition of Call to Communion on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 60 Seconds with Mother Angelica. The good news is that as we struggle and God pours grace into us and we correspond and we rise and we fall, rise and fall, God in his infinite mercy loves us, keeps us going, gives us strength and courage and joy, joy. Be joyful. Go on, smile. It won't hurt you, even if you got a problem. Even if you got a problem, smile at your neighbor. I want you to remember a little sentence, and the sentence is this. You may be the only Jesus your neighbor will ever see. I want you to know your dignity. I want you to know how great you are before God. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. When you listen to Women of Grace Live, it's not possible to come away from that hour without feeling encouraged, without feeling inspired, without feeling that you've just had the opportunity to enter into holy conversation. This holy conversation comes by way of the many callers who share with us the concerns of their heart, the issues that they're facing. I'm Johnette Benkovic, inviting you to join me weekday mornings at 11 Eastern for Women of Grace on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hi, this is Jerry Usher. Thanks for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Uh, 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 put down that phone. We're not taking calls today. This is a mailbag program. Because, after all, it is the day after Thanksgiving, and we're all still in digestion mode, right? 
Not indigestion. We are still digesting that fabulous meal that we had that, yesterday. That, that's right? how I feel. I had a giant lunch yesterday, and it's still sitting with me. <laughs> I cooked fresh sardines. I stir really? fried them in my kitchen. I love them. But the rest of my family is furious at me because the house, like, has been smelling like sardines. I can only hours. imagine. I, I everyone I, but my dog is mad at me. That's pretty funny. And the dog is going like, where's mine? Where's right, mine? Exactly. I knew it. Twelve minutes after the hour, let's uh, take an email here from Cecily in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and uh, Cecily says, hello, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anders. As Catholics, we believe that entrance into the body of Christ comes through baptism. I was wondering if unbaptized believers are a member of his body as well. And if, because of their faith in Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit and he is now dwelling in them. Thanks so much for all the good work you do. I'm truly grateful to hear the Catholic faith taught and explained so beautifully and faithfully as it is done on EWTN. God bless you all. Cecily in Anchorage, Alaska, what do you think? Okay, Cecily, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So uh, the sacraments are the means that Christ has given us to participate in sanctifying grace, to be joined to the body of Christ, receive forgiveness of our sins, and strengthening for our Christian life. And, uh, and so we have no guarantee from Christ for the dispensation of grace outside the sacraments, all right? Um, so we can't presume about anybody that's, that's not in the church. We can't say, I know with certainty that that person is saved. We can't say that about them. On the other hand, uh, we, um, uh, the church tells us explicitly that there are elements of truth and sanctification outside the formal boundaries of the Catholic Church, uh -huh. and that everyone has an opportunity to respond to the light of revelation that they have received, um, uh, to respond in faith, and to be associated with the Paschal mystery of Christ in a way known only to God himself. So we don't write off people outside the formal boundaries of the church. I mean, even you know, non-Catholic Christians and even non-Christians uh, may possibly be associated to the Paschal mystery of Christ and incorporated into him, yeah. right? Um, and, and, uh, and, and also there's the case of those who are baptized by desire, you know, so someone who has learned the truth about Christ desires baptism and, you know, drops dead on their way into the baptismal font, for instance. You know, that person is not cut off from Christ. Um, or, uh, or, you know, the baptism by blood, which is, which is efficacious as well. You know, someone who hears the truth about Christ, confesses faith in Christ, wishes to be received in the church, but they die a martyr's death. I mean, that's, a, that's always been recognized by the church is inclusion into the body of Christ, baptism by blood. So the, the normal means, the normative means given to us by Christ is baptism. This is the guarantee of our participation in the body of Christ. All who have been baptized have clothed themselves with Christ. That's what St. Paul says in Galatians 3.27. And so uh, when someone hears the gospel, we have to encourage them to receive the sacraments. That's what Christ demanded. No promise of grace outside the sacraments, but, you know, that we have a, a well-founded hope sure. that, you know, those people can be safe. But not if they know the truth and resist. If they refuse to enter the church, refuse to receive the sacraments, then that would be disobedience on their part. And we don't have a lot of hope. Yeah, we, oh boy, you don't want to go there. Absolutely not. Fifteen after the hour, this is called a communion on EWTN. We're handling your... Uh, uh, emailed in questions today, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com is the address if you'd like to send us a uh, an email for a future show. Here's one from Abby. Abby says, hi there, I was just listening to your show from November 6th in which you answered a question about the miraculous birth of Christ. You gave the parallel of the resurrected Christ's passage through a wall in the upper room. But this interpretation of Christ's birth sounds suspiciously Gnostic to me and detracts from the full reality of the Incarnation. How could he be fully human in this understanding? Is Christ's resurrected and glorified body fully analogous to his body at birth? I know the Church teaches Mary's perpetual virginity, but what does she actually teach dogmatically about Mary's experience during childbirth? I'm sure there is much theological speculation, but I'd like to know what is actually articulated by the church. Thanks so much, Abby. Sure, thanks, Abby, so much. I appreciate it. Well, of course, the resurrected body of Christ is fully body and fully material. Yep. All right, so that you know, the, the, the analogy stands there. The church teaches that Mary remained a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. So it's not only a, a miraculous conception, but also a miraculous birth. Yeah. All right. Now, how does that work out? Well, you know, th there's a good deal of mystery there, right? But the physical birth of Christ was, in fact, a miraculous birth. It wasn't simply, 
you know, the normal passage of a baby down through the birth canal with all the attendant pains and sufferings sure. That, uh, sure. that a woman would, would have. So that's the dogmatic teaching of the church. There you go. 17 after the hour. This is Mailbag's version of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Here's one from um, Jane who says, uh, Hi, Dr. Andrews. Father Mitch asserts that Mary did not live in Ephesus. On Monday, November 9th, you mentioned you believe Mary was assumed from emphasis, Ephesus. The two positions confuse me. I listened to the podcast of Father Mitch's Open Line Wednesday show that day. Uh, here is his explanation from my notes. Thanks, Jane. And this, this is the explanation that she gives. Three reasons why Mary probably did not live in or even travel over to Ephesus. Number one, St. John did not go to Ephesus in the 50s when St. Paul was the first to go there. Number two, St. John did not go to Ephesus in the 60s. This is 60 A.D. when St. Paul wrote to Timothy, who was the bishop of Ephesus, after St. Paul left. Number three, St. John may not have arrived at Ephesus until the 70s, at which point, at which point Our Lady would have been in her 90s. That makes it very unlikely. Mary lived on Mount Zion in southwest Old City, near the Upper Room, near the Church of Dormition. Mary's tomb is in a cave at the base of the Mount of Olives outside the wall. This is the earlier tradition. So, David, what do you say about all that? Okay. Fair okay, let's, let's go to our next question here. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's fine. Uh, this is, you know, what the Church dogmatically teaches about the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary is that she was assumed. That's and really that, all we need that, to know. That's what we have to know. And there are, there are different small T traditions within, within the Catholic world about uh -huh. the life of of our Blessed Mother after the Ascension of Christ. Um, and, uh, and you know, the Church hasn't dogmatized about that. So, you know, there's there's room for difference of opinion mm -hmm. and, and, even, and even argument and, you know, laying out the case and so forth. And uh, Father Mitch has the advantage over me in having traveled extensively in the Holy Land, and I've never been there. So, you know, fair enough. Sounds good to me. At 19 after the hour, this is called a communion on EWTN. We're answering those emailed questions today. Uh, and the address is ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Here's one from Pam who says, Dear Dr. Anders, many years ago when a new cemetery was opened in our city, my in-laws purchased four plots in the, quote, Catholic section, one for each of their three children, one for my father-in-law. My mother-in-law, who was not Catholic, was not allowed to have a plot in the Catholic section, which is why they didn't purchase five plots side by side. Now, years later, when my in-laws relocated to another state, they turned the titles of those four plots over to my husband and me for our family's use one day. So here's my question. What are the rules for burial in a, quote, Catholic cemetery section? Must the person be Catholic or not? I've always felt it cruel that a family would have to be split apart in death due to religious affiliation. Thanks for answering my questions. Oh, uh, this is also from Anchorage, Alaska. She says, uh, Anchorage recently got EWTN radio. We're so excited. My husband and I love your show and listen to it daily. Again, that's from Pam in Anchorage. Okay, thanks, Pam. Uh, I have to confess that the, that the, the church law on cemeteries and burial is not my particular forte, so okay. I, but I'm going to do my best. All right, so the, the purpose of Catholic cemeteries is, in general, for the burial of Catholics. Uh, is you know, consecrated for that purpose, um, and it's, uh, it's fitting for Catholics to be buried together. They share a common belief in the resurrection, belief in relics, and so forth. Um, and uh, so the purchasers of lots in a Catholic cemetery need to be Catholic. I know there are archdioceses, however, that do allow non-Catholic family members to be buried there as well because there's also an interest in keeping families together, sure, which is for precisely the, the situation that you, that you yeah. laid out. So that's, that's acceptable. Okay, very good. 21 after the hour. Thanks for joining us today on Call to Communion here on EWTN. Let's go to uh, William in Columbus, Ohio. He says, Dr. Anders, I would like to know how I should react to the Jimmy Swaggart Sun Life programs that include a lot of anti-Catholic commentary. Should I just ignore it, stop watching? Since it's their TV station, they can say what they want. Or should I try to defend the church in some way? William in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, sure. Thanks, William. I really appreciate that. So if your only contact with this program is by watching it on television, all right, then I, I think the best thing to do is probably not watch it. It's not, yeah. it's not edifying. It's not true. 
Uh, yeah. So you're not learning anything true about God or the faith of the spiritual life. And instead, you might just be getting your, you know, getting your ire up, listening to all this anti-Catholic stuff coming across the line. Best thing to do is probably turn it off. You know, I know in in my own life, uh, not so. Much, I, I'm not very inclined to watch Jimmy Swaggart, but from time to time, <laughs> I start listening to political programming, and I know, you know, after a couple of months of doing that, I realize, you know, nothing I've heard is actually going to change the way I vote. And if history is any guide, the way I vote is not going to change the actual public policy. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So I could probably spend my time a lot better if I spent it in prayer or study or doing good deeds or helping my neighbor or teaching my children. I've got better things to do than sit around and listen to, to an anti-Catholic rant. Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, I think it's kind of funny. We're, uh, we're coming up on this election year. Uh, we, we may have discussed this in the past. I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, here in Alabama... We generally don't get any political commercials on the national level, and I just think that is wonderful. I, I really do. I, I, I visited family and friends in Ohio, and they're just lambasted, uh, lambasted by, by, you know, one political ad after another. Same thing for Florida and other states where, where the election is, is considered in play, but because Alabama generally votes pretty much one way, uh, we don't get any of that. And our, our primary comes so late in the year. Or it, it traditionally does. did. It that does. The, the candidates yeah. more or less pick by the time they get to us. Yeah. So, so uh, you, those... you know how you can recapitulate the Alabama experience? Just How's flip that? off your television. Yeah. You know. Yeah, which is not always a bad thing. Yeah. Except for EWT. I will, of course. That goes without saying. There you go. 23 after the hour. Here is a uh, email from Mike in Houston who says, Hello, Dr. Anders. Can you please give a few references where Luther rejects that he broke away from the church due to corruption, but he, that he actually did so for the message of the gospel. You've mentioned this a couple of times on your show. I'd like to find those places. Thanks for all you do. Mike in Houston. Okay, sure. Uh, let me see if I can remember. It's been an awful long time since I was tested on the texts of Luther. <laughs> but if memory serves me correct, mm -hmm. the beginning of the Luther's response to Erasmus's diatribe on free will. Luther in 1525 wrote a book called uh, On the Bondage of the Will. And in the, in the prefatory material, he may make that claim. Because I know he commends Erasmus. He says everybody else dealt with inessential items and Erasmus has gone straight to the heart of the matter, the difference between me, Luther, and, and the Catholics. Uh -huh. um, and uh, he may actually make that claim there. Outside of that, um, you know, if you look at uh, Luther's sermons on, on, I'm trying to think, Timothy Lull published a, a volume of, of uh, the works of Luther that's pretty representative, and if you read some of the early material there, it probably, you'll probably find the quote. I mean, I read it many times in Luther. It's not, I mean, this isn't, I'm not making a radical claim. I mean, any Lutheran scholar would tell you the same thing. I'm thinking the prefatory material in On the Bondage of the Will from 1525 is probably a good place to go. Okay, fair but enough. But if that doesn't work, write me back and I'll, I'll dig one up for you. Sounds good. Here is one from The Captain. He's, uh, that's, that's the name he's using. So, okay, The Captain, who's listening to us on iHeartRadio, says, Dr. Anders, I can't wrap my head around God's immutability, especially in context of Paul saying that God listens to the prayers of the righteous. I'm currently struggling with a particular sin, but I'm working to change in hopes of one day, uh, in, in hopes of becoming one of those righteous. Living in a world in which there is an action and a reaction, I can't understand how a God who doesn't react would respond. Can you explain this, or is this an example of Augustine's, if I can understand it, it's not God? <laughs> well, well, Augustine never said that. He did not. First okay. of all, that's not an Augustinian notion. Okay. Uh, on the contrary, Augustine's famous for the statement, I believe in order that I might understand. Ah, okay. All right. Luther is the one that said, if it makes sense, it didn't God. All right. <laughs> Again, in the bondage of the will. Sure. All right. So, uh, first of all, uh, it's a point of Catholic doctrine that our language about God is entirely analogical. All right, we can we can speak about things in three ways. We can we can talk about them univocally. All right, so mm -hmm. you know, when I say that this, uh, uh, you know, my, this this book over here is rectangular and this piece of paper is rectangular. Yes. The word rectangle has the exact same sense in both instances. That's yeah. univocal predication. And univocally, we're about to run out of time for this call. We I hear, are. I hear but, the music running. But, but maybe, maybe we, we can jump pick on this, it. Okay. Let's, let's pick it up on the we'll other side. We'll pick it up on the other side. Sure. We also have an email here from Gene, who listens to us in uh, Seattle on Sacred Heart Radio. One from Michael in St. Louis. 
Tony. Well, we'll get to as many of these as we can during the special mailbag edition of Call to Communion. Don't go away. The pertinent question that is on the mind of modern man is whether belief in God is credible and responsible in light of contemporary science. We at the Maja Center believe that we can answer this question in the affirmative. There are two ways in which science gives credence to theism. First, science can provide observational data taken from within the universe that points to an absolute beginning of time and physical reality, which metaphysically necessitates a transcendent creator. Secondly, science can give evidence of finely tuned characteristics of the laws of physics that are necessary for life to develop in our universe. We call these anthropic coincidences, and such coincidences can only be responsibly and reasonably explained by supernatural intelligence. For these two reasons, science makes belief in God credible. To learn more about this topic, visit our website, MajaCenter.com. I'm Carlo Broussard, apologist and speaker for the Maja Center, with your Majus Minute. When Pope John Paul II landed in Washington, D.C. and was greeted by then-President Reagan, the president said, Welcome to the land of the free. And John Paul II said, Free, yes, but free for what? Free for what? It seems today that we define freedom as the ability to do whatever you want. Of course, doing whatever we feel like doing in the moral realm doesn't necessarily lead to freedom, but often leads to vice. Vice. That's the perfect word for it. It's a destructive habit that grabs us kind of like a vice grip and doesn't let us go very easily. Don't believe me? Think of your favorite sin. Now try to stop. <laughs> Genesis 4, 7 says, Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and become its master. You see, freedom isn't the ability to do whatever we want. It's the power to do what's right. And ultimately, true freedom is the power to love. That's the kind of freedom Jesus Christ modeled for us in his life and in his death. And it's the kind of freedom he's inviting us to live in today. I'm Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396 If you're just joining us, we're doing a special mailbag edition of the program today since this is the uh, day after Thanksgiving. Most offices are closed, people are out shopping, or they're uh, recovering from all that they ate yesterday. Uh, do you have a preference, uh, pumpkin pie or pecan pie? Oh, pecan, 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 pecan. Is that a Southern thing? It is. It is. I, I had mothers and grandmothers and aunts and great aunts that had pecan trees in their yards and you know just it, it's thanksgiving is pecan time for me well okay you know all right so there uh why don't we go back to these uh, emails that we've got today since so uh, hang on we got to finish this one i beg your pardon friend of ours wanted to know about god's immutability and what that implies about his answering prayers doesn't correct it, you know correct. God, doesn't god change in response to human prayer so so uh, I launched into a discussion of analogical predication, but I'm going to put that aside for a minute and just deal immediately with the question of God's immutability. God has to be immutable, can't change for all kinds of reasons. One of them is God's absolutely simple. He has no parts. All right, Anything that's subject to change uh, has uh, one part that stays the same and one part changes. All right, mm-hmm. That's what, you know, ch- and God being absolutely simple has no parts, so since he's indivisible, he can't uh He can't change. Um, God is the absolute source and origin of all things. He's pure act. He doesn't have any potentiality. All right, there'd have to be something prior to or outside of God that would kind of, you know, take the, uh, you know, the final responsibility for things in order to in order to elicit any potential in God. God Mm -hmm. is has no potentiality. He's pure act. He's infinite. He's already actualized every possible potential. All right. And so he can't change because he has no potentiality. All right. God is the ultimate source and origin of all things. Um, so uh, the way to conceive of God's acting on us without his own change, there are some analogies we can look at from human experience. So keep in mind, for instance, the way the earth acts upon a smaller object, you know, by the force of gravity. So here's the earth sitting here not moving. Yeah. And yet it's, it, it's exerting a powerful force on you know, on something else, drawing it towards it. That's a good way of thinking about the way God acts on us. God, you know, can can exert influence on us, powerful influence, with that himself being subject to change. Or think about the way the sun, uh, and this is a weak analogy because, of course, the sun is changing and burning, but the way the light of the sun can affect growth and heat and light and change sure. without itself being changed. All right, so these are, these are analogies to help us understand this kind of dynamic. Um, God... Uh, sees everything in a permanent instant. So God eternally creates, that is to say outside of time, eternally creates 
a temporal universe. All right, so process and change are part of our experience, but from God's point of view, it takes place in a permanent instant. In God's providential design, he makes use of the prayers of human beings uh, in order to bring about his purposes. They have mm -hmm. a real causal effect. They do, uh, they do accomplish things. Our prayers actually do accomplish things by God's design. God's plan is that in response to human prayer, the plan of God, the plan of history, is going to play out a certain way in our, in our instrumental acts, our instrumental causality, including our prayers, play a role in that. So we shouldn't think of the, our prayers actually changing God in some profound metaphysical sense, but they do cha change our relationship to God and the relationship of other people to God. So when we talk about God changing or moving in response to human prayers, this is at best an analogical way of describing it. It's describing it from the point of view of human experience. Mm -hmm. From our experience, it seems that I've changed, you know, that God has changed towards me. What really has happened is, you know, my back was away from the sun and now I'm facing towards the sun. Yeah. The sun seems to have changed relative position relative to me, but all that's really happened is I've turned. Yeah, it reminds me of a book that my wife once got, uh, How to Change Your Husband. Well, oh, okay. the actual key of it was you've got to change. Right, exactly. That's that's the key. Uh, Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, who was a Dominican theologian, advisor to popes, teacher at the Angelicum during the the, uh, uh, the youth of Pope John Paul II, who yes. was a student at the Angelicum, mm -hmm. once gave this illustration. I thought it was very helpful. He said, imagine a rock on the shore, all right, and you're out in a boat. You've got a rope. Uh, you're sitting in the boat, and the rope is tighter on the rock, all right, and you're sitting there tugging on the rope, all right, and from a relative point of view, it looks like you're pulling the rock closer and closer to yourself. All right, but the rock's not moving. The rock's not moving. All you're doing is pulling yourself closer to the rock. He says that's a good analogy for the way the life of prayer works. Love it. That is fantastic. 33 after the hour. This is a special mailbag edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Now let's go to Gene, who listens to us on Sacred Heart Radio in uh, Seattle. And Gene has a couple of couple of great things here. Uh, what does a plenary indulgence consist of? Also, can it be gained both by an individual and for the deceased? She says, uh, in parochial grade school back in the day, we had been told that saying a certain set of prayers on All Souls Day would send a soul shooting straight to heaven. What do you think? Okay, thanks so much. So, uh, an indulgence is the remission of the temporal punishment due to sin, all right? The church can administer those by distributing the merits of the saints, the supererogatory merits, those excessive merits, merits beyond which, you know, what's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and I've used the illustration before on the air. Imagine that, uh, you know, I tell my son to clean up a mess. He's got an obligation to to do some sort of temporal act of reparation. And along comes his older brother and says, I'll, I'll lend you a hand, all right? He's helping his little brother get the job done. Well, that's what the saints do. They come by, and lend a hand, help mm -hmm. us make up what we need made up. And the, the church is in the position of the parents saying to the older brother, hey, come lend a hand, you know, distributing the merits of the saints on our behalf. Sure. And she does so, and she chooses to do so in response to things that she wants us to encourage it wants to encourage us to do anyway. So the church likes us to pray, likes us to give alms to the poor, likes us to read the Bible, you know, likes us to go to Mass. And so uh, the church attaches special promises to those things, and they're called indulgences. Hey, if you, you know, read your scripture so many minutes a day, if you pray the rosary, if you do these things, then we'll, you know, we'll kick in a plenary indulgence. Now, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Right. It's not a, certainly not a get-out-of-hell-free card, even a <laughs> get-out-of-purgatory-free card. In order to really obtain the full remission of all temporal punishment due to sin, we have to have no attachment to sin, all right? So there's a pretty high bar for yeah. gaining a plenary indulgence. It consists in more than just, hey, you know, say this prayer and a soul jumps out of purgatory. That that would be a kind of a superstitious way of looking at it, I think. You think she was misled maybe uh, in, well, I mean, in parochial school? I, I think the parochial school in, wanted to encourage her to do the devotions and to have a lively hope in the in the intercessory power of the church, and that's commendable. Sure. Sometimes, you know, devotional language doesn't always track with dogmatic teaching. And, yeah. uh, and people can get a little excessive in the promises they attach to certain devotions. But for a little kid, it might be uh, it might be very helpful to get the point across. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. 36 after the hour, here is one, and, and, and I must say, David, this is my favorite email of the day. My favorite one yet. Is it a recipe for pecan pie? It is not. Okay. Here it is, Michael from St. Louis, who says... Are there any places where Mass cannot be validly celebrated? For example, 
can it be celebrated in zero gravity, such as on the International Space Station? That that yeah. is a that is a really good question. How about and it? I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, something tells me there's got to be some place you can't say mass, but off the top of my head, I can't. You mm. know, I mean, it, uh, there there have got to be situations it's not appropriate. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I, something tells me that if we had Catholics in outer space on a space station or something, I can imagine that we might be able to have mass in space. But got I don't it. know that we've ever had to address that question directly. Maybe someday. Here's one from Tony who says, uh, Dr. Andrews, a good friend of mine who is Protestant, periodically scoffs at the idea of the Catholic Church's claim that it is one, as opposed to the Protestant Church, which has many splits. He asks, how can the Catholic Church claim this when they are split over issues like celibacy for priests, women as priests, contraceptions, theologians like Hans Kung and others? Um, he also mentions a group or a book called Nuns on the Bus, which I'm not familiar with, as a point against the claim of the unity of the Catholic Church. How do I respond to this challenge? Tony. Oh, very easy. Thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate it. So uh, uh, Catholics are not divided over the content of the faith at all. And if people choose to reject the teaching of the Catholic faith, it's very clear what they're rejecting. So if I ask you, Tony, right now, what is the Church's position on women priests or celibate priests or any of these other controversial issues that you've raised, you know the answer. You yeah. know the answer, all right? You know what the dogma dogmatic teaching of the Church is. That's what the unity of the faith consists in. The unity of the faith consists in our adherence to the teaching of the Church. Now, if someone understands the teaching, for, teaching of the Church and rejects it, well, then they've separated themselves from the unity of the faith. Mm. Good point. So that doesn't that doesn't wound the unity of the church at all. All right, the very fact that there is a Catholic position on these things from which you can dissent uh -huh. is proof of the church's unity. I mean, if I ask you, what is the Protestant position on women pastors? There is no Protestant position on women pastors. It depends on what Protestant church you go to. All right, there is no center of, of authority from which all Protestants can dissent or to which all Protestants can. Uh, assent. Yeah. There is a Catholic position on all these yeah. issues. That's yeah. what the unity of the faith consists That's in. That's what we're talking about, right, not exactly. what, you know, these hundred Catholics believe and what they don't believe. And they may not be Catholics. I mean, they, you know, by their, if they separate themselves definitively from the teaching of the church, then they're heretics. Whether they call themselves a Catholic or not. Right, exactly. Okay, very good. We're going to take one more break here. When we come back, we'll go to uh, Brian in uh, West Virginia, also Hillary. And here's one from Regina and Sterling in Louisiana. Uh, got a lot of great questions here coming up for you on this edition of Call to Communion, a uh, special mailbag edition here on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 60 Seconds with Father Mitch Pacwa. Jesus told us as a command, not as, you know, would you guys mind going out and preaching the gospel? It would be okay. He didn't say that. He, what he said is, go and preach the gospel. He said, if you got time, no, no, he wasn't hesitant at all. This is urgent. Get out there. People need good news. They're committing sins. They're getting themselves ready for hell. They're working for the enemy and they don't even know it. They're using drugs and all the deadly things. They're committing murder. Go out and preach the good news. He commands it. And this always maintains its vital value. There's no time where, well, that was sort of an old part of our culture. We don't do that anymore. That's not my Bible. My Bible doesn't say that it's a part of the old culture. This is part of today's culture. Amen? Amen. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. We are whittling down the size of our manila folder full of uh, emails that we've received over the last couple of days, weeks. Uh, hopefully there's nothing older than that. 
Uh, but we, we en- enjoy doing these mailbag programs from time to time because uh, we can kind of stretch out, take a little bit more time to answer the, each of these questions. So we're glad to be doing that today. 41 after the hour, here is one from Brian in Renton, West Virginia, who says, Hey, Dr. Anders, I am a Catholic and was talking with my non-Catholic friend about the King James Bible and why it was created in addition to the Geneva Bible. He said, before there was an English translation, the Catholic bishops didn't want lay people to be able to read the Bible themselves or interpret it, and they would burn people at the stake for trying. Can you share any knowledge on this subject since I had never heard this before? Thanks, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Brian in West Virginia. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. So, of course, the Catholic Church is the, uh, the, the body instituted by Christ, authorized by Christ, to promulgate the Bible, to transmit the Bible down to the generations. Without right. the Catholic Church, we wouldn't have a Bible. Henry yeah. Graham, convert to Catholicism from the Scottish Presbyterian tradition, wrote a great little book called Where We Got the Bible, Our Debt to the Catholic Church, that I would recommend to you. I highly commend it. Um, showing that it was the Catholic Church in the late 4th century that actually compiled the canon of Scripture and said, this is the Bible. All right, before that time, there had been a lot of controversies about which books should be included in the text of sacred Scripture and which ones should be ex- excluded. And, of course, there's no principled way to make that decision unless you have a, uh, an authority that has divine authority that can, that can do that, and that is the Catholic Church. As soon as the Bible was promulgated, of course, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew, Greek, and some small portions in Aramaic, uh, translations began to emerge within the Catholic world. So Catholics translated the Bible into Latin, for instance, into Syriac, into Persian, into Arabic, into Coptic. Um, and then in the Middle Ages, we find translations of the, the Bible by Catholics into, into Saxon, into the Celtic languages, into, um, uh, you know, into the Germanic tongues. As soon as um, uh, English emerges as a distinct tongue, uh, you know, after the uh, Chaucerian period, we find translations of the Bible into, into, uh, into uh, Middle English and then into Early Modern English, into French and Spanish and Italian and all the vernacular languages of Europe by Catholics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and as soon as you know, printing was invented, we began to find Bibles printed. Uh, so the idea that the Catholic Church somehow opposed the translation of the Bible or access by the laity to sacred scripture is absurd and historically false. What is true is the church felt that it had, but knows that it has jurisdiction over how the Bible is translated. And so it had a very strong interest in opposing heretical translations of the Bible. Sure. So for instance, William Tyndale, who's a, a Protestant name that's often associated with Bible translation, is sort of held up as a you know, Protestant martyr against Catholic opposition or so forth. First of all, Tyndale was assassinated by agents of Henry VIII, not by uh, not by the Catholic Church. All right, so it was the the Anglicans opposed his work as well as the Catholics did. Tyndale appended to his translations a lot of commentaries that included um, uh, manifest heresies. All right, and uh, that were opposed not only by Catholics but by Anglicans as well. Wow. Um, and uh, and there were a lot of translations that were bad translations, heretical translations that incorporated the translator's own ideas rather than the sense of the sacred text. And, um, you know, after the King James Bible came out, of course, the Catholic Church responded by issuing the Douay Reims uh, translation of the Bible into mm-hmm. English. So we've always had Catholic translations of the Bible in every age and culture, um, but we want to make sure they're good translations. Sure. Brian, we hope that is helpful for you. Quarter till the top of the hour, here's one from Hillary who says, Hey, Dr. Anders, I wonder if you could speak about two issues relating to the Old Testament. The first concerns how we are to interpret the account of Adam and Eve in light of what we know from science about evolution. Doesn't the preponderance of scientific evidence support polygenism or genism, humans having descended from a pool of early human couples, not monogenism from one original couple? Secondly, when my young child asks me whether all the people in the Old Testament were real, what should I say? I know we are not to interpret all events in the Old Testament literally, but is there historical evidence that people like Cain and Abel, uh, Job, Noah, and Abraham existed? Thanks. I love your show. That's from Hillary. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So this is an issue that Pope Pius XII spoke to specifically in his encyclical Humani Generis on Human Origins, where he teaches that Catholics are bound by a matter by 
by, by dogma, it's, it's defined de fide, to believe in monogenesis. Now, the, uh, the, there are any number of ways that you, can, that you can accommodate what would seem to be the evidence of the, the, uh, the genetic evidence for polygenesis, the DNA evidence for polygenesis, with what we know from dogmatic teaching. And Pius addresses these, so there's no barrier, uh, if you want, you're allowed as a Catholic to believe, for instance, that the first human couple into which God infused the immortal soul, you know, the Adam and Eve, if you will, um, that, the, that the, the, the dust of the earth into which God infused that human soul, in fact, had a, had a biological origin uh, through natural selection that could have included uh, all of this disparate DNA material that shows up you know, in modern anthropological theories of polygenesis, all right? So the two things can be accommodated. All you're bound to believe as a Catholic is that from that massive genetic material, however it arose and however many biological ancestors they may have had, God infused the immortal soul into a single human couple, all right, from which the, uh, uh, the human race is currently descended, all right? Um, anyway, I'd recommend to your attention Pius's work. There are some good theological articles on this that show how Catholic doctrine, doctrine can be accommodated to what we know from anthropology. And uh, I've been sitting here trying to remember the name of one of them that I've got in mind, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. If I do, before the end of the show, I'll get back to you with it. Okay, very good. 48 minutes after the hour. This one is a little bit uh, on the lengthy side. We always ask that you play, please keep your emails uh, pretty short, a couple of sentences, try to wrap up what you want to say. Uh, but this person, Regina, is writing, uh, this is in response to a call that we had um, maybe a few weeks ago on women priests. And she says, I too, uh, many years ago, about 25 years ago, I too wanted to be a priest in the worst way. Not for the power or prestige, but because I was told that the priest is configured to Jesus and the laity and religious are configured to our Blessed Mother. Now, I love our Blessed Mother, but Jesus is God and Mary is not. So to me, that meant that the laity or religious are inferior to the priest, meaning all women except Mary are inferior. I have prayed for priests a lot, but that didn't help me to take away the desire to be a priest. I wanted to have the opportunity to share my love for Christ with others the way that only a priest can. Uh, a very wise priest told me that God can and does work outside of the sacraments. That helped me somewhat. But it is an experience that I had one morning in Holy Mass during the Epiclesis in which God gave me a better alternative. I heard with my mind and heart the words that my prayer for priests is like the blood that flows to the head and nourishes the brain. I understand that the priest is configured to Christ, the head of the body, the church. Then I heard, why would you want to be a priest when you can help all priests with your prayers? I confirm with my spiritual director that this was from God and my desire to be a priest lessened and my desire to pray for priests increased. I can now say that I have no desire to be a priest. When certain painful events happened in my life, I stopped my regular prayer for priests a few years for a, for a few years. I recently felt God calling me back to it. It is my main ministry that I hope to increase over the rest of my life. Thanks for your very interesting and informative program. That's from Regina. Regina, thank you so much. I really appreciate your sentiments, and uh, and I'm so glad for the the way these things have resolved in your yeah. own spiritual life. Yeah. I would like to comment on one or two things that you that you said. Of course, you know the Catholic Church does not teach that priests are in any way spiritually superior or preferable to the vocation of the laity or women. Um, the the ministerial priesthood is a ministry of service to the baptismal priesthood. All Christians, by their baptism, are priests in the Catholic Church, ordained to offer sacrifices, the sacrifice of their own prayers, works, joys, and sufferings, and to bring other people to God, to act in an intercessory and apostolic ministry, to witness to the truth about Christ, to win other people to the Church, and to offer their own prayers and sacrifices. To that priesthood, the priesthood of all believers, the ministerial, I mean, excuse me, the baptismal priesthood, the ministerial priests, the ordained priests, act as servants, all right? They act as servants. They effect the sacrament of the altar, uh, but all of us together offer it in our own interior lives along sure. with, that, uh, with that ministerial offering. Um, by virtue of their priesthood, 
they are not, uh, they don't have a higher place in heaven, all right? In fact, they they're, you know, may very likely be priests in hell, priests in purgatory, priests in heaven by the skin of their teeth. And, uh, and the holiness of a, of a saintly layperson is, a, is far greater. You know, I mean, a priesthood is a call to holiness. All of Christian life is a call to holiness. But the sacrament of orders doesn't guarantee the life of holiness in an individual priest. He, he has a service. He has a job to do at the service of the baptismal priesthood. doesn't make him a better person. It, he, he ought to be a better person, but doesn't automatically make him a better person. All of us can acquire, however, the perfection of the gospel. Christ says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. All of us can live the call of Christian perfection according to our state of life. Mm. So, you know, we're made perfect in love, sure. right? not, by, not specifically by our state of life. Um, but thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Now, one thing, the previous call about uh, polygenesis, uh, monogenesis, yeah. and humani generis, the, the encyclical, I said I was going to think about an article. There is an article called Science, Theology, and Monogenesis by Kenneth Kemp uh, that is um, at uh, Notre Dame's website. It's available online. This is uh, one theologian's attempt to integrate what we know from anthropology with what the magisterium has taught on monogenesis. I'm not saying it's the best possible approach, but it's one you might look at, Kenneth Kemp's article, Science, Theology, and Monogenesis. Okay, very good. 52 after the hour, almost 53 after. This is called a communion on EWTN. I'm not sure how much of this we can tackle. This is from Morgan, who says, in Luke 11, it says, and it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In my opinion, Mary is not any more important than anyone else. Jesus said that people who just believe the world and keep it more blessed. How can you say that we are supposed to pray to her? And don't you get sick of living by laws? Christ came so that we could be free from laws. What do you think? Oh, yeah, thank you so much. So uh, when, when she notes that Christ said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it, that's precisely what the Blessed Virgin did, mm. right? She said, she heard the gospel, she heard the annunciation, and she said, be it done to me according to thy word. All right. So she, yes, she was, she physically bore Christ, but she's also uh, the first Christian who heard the word of God and believed it. But her physical uh, birth of Christ is incredibly significant because she became the mother of God. Hmm. She became the mother of God. All right. Now, that, that's a unique position from the beginning of time to the end of time. There's only one woman who is about whom we can say that she's the mother of God. That's as unique as it gets. How can you deny that that's significant? And she herself prophesied all generations will call me blessed. Now, in terms of uh, invoking the prayers of the Blessed Virgin, that's, a, that's another can of worms that I don't think we're going to have time to answer. But consider that we ask for the prayers of all of the saints, all of uh, the, the living and dead, yeah. uh, members of the church to intercede on our behalf with Christ, as, if, as in fact we're told by sacred scripture to do. Pray for one another, says St. James. We know from Revelation 5, 8, the saints in heaven are up there offering up our prayers. Thanks for joining us this time on this mailbag edition of Call to Communion. See you next time.